Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Um, that's it. Any questions? Christine. Yes, thank you, Arthur. Um, so from what I'm understanding, I know that a lot of consumers um, that the ASAPs and many of the agencies do with have a need for skilled services that would keep them at home and that skilled service would be medication administration. So as you are seeing and in, in learning and interpreting this, mm -hmm. your understanding is you, we're very unlikely under Medicare to get a nurse to go in every day to do med administration mm -hmm. unless it's a bigger package of services that is cost effective, so to speak. I think that's right. Okay. I think that's right. But I think that that's, 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 this is a classic case where we need to get beyond kind of legal theory, right? And the, with all this stuff, the lawyer stuff, and down with those folks to actually look, look at what the rates look like, mm -hmm. how these folks get paid, and whether there is this package of services um, that works. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer to that. Maybe there aren't. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is no package that's actually going to help people, right? And that and that will cause v the VNAs and the SNFs to want to be doing it. Mm -hmm. I just don't know. Do you know if anything else is happening in any other state as far as implementing this? I know that the same problem is occurring all nationally. Uh, I was recently talking to Deb Gittner. Some of you may know, a wonderful GCM, who I do a lot of who I do a lot of stuff who was all excited because she and her partner, Linda Sullivan, acting on behalf of a patient, had done an appeal all the way through the ALJ uh, and won. Oh. And the ALJ said, um, yes, it does appear that based on the, what was presented, right, that this person needed services or would have qualified for Medicare, services paid for by Medicare when this happened mm -hmm. a year and a half. Now, in the meantime, I can't remember if the patient died or was just much, much in a much different condition, which means that package of services now is no longer justified. Mm -hmm. And as far as the skilled nursing facility in that case was concerned, so was there any, there was no like penalty, right? Because the skilled nursing facility simply didn't provide the services, right? So it wasn't like they provided them and so now something is going to happen. And, but by the way, imagine that they had provided them. Imagine that the skilled nursing facility had said, okay, we're going to buy into this GMO plan, right? Or, or alternatively, we're, we're going to, we're, and this is, they'll tell their patients, they'll say, well, we'll provide the services for you on private pay, mm -hmm. right? But then if you appeal and you succeed, right, well, then we'll accept the, the Medicare rate. Right, which they have, right? If it if it turns out that they win, but what nursing home wants to go there, right? So they provide the pri the skilled services at the private pay rate. They get paid at the private pay rate. The patient then appeals and wins. Now they have to return the money to the patient that they were paid at the private pay rate, and accept the Medicare rate for those services which may have been at a, a losing Medicare rate. Mm -hmm. So you see there's just there's no incentive mm -hmm. to any of these players to kind of to do this, right? To cooperate right now because there's there's no reason why they have to, right? There's no reason why the nursing homes and the and the and the BNAs have to provide the services, right? They don't have to provide them for anything but private pay during the appeal period, right? So th th there's this question of kind of what to do. Now, one of the, you know, one of the other th you know, thoughts that we've, I've had as I've, been, as I've thought about this is, so is this something that needs to be addressed to the regulatory system in Massachusetts? Do we need to have Ma uh, Mass Health saying or DPH saying to the extent that these services, or that, they, that these services can be justified using some kind of standard 
they have to be provided, right? As a matter of DPH, state DPH regulations. I don't know. I don't know. I, I am at a loss. I'm just telling goes, you. I think it goes way back even further than that. I yeah. think it really needs to start at HR level at companies with insurance. I think people need to be paying into long-term care earlier. And because when we, when we reach the end, we just don't have the funds to fund this. To fund it. Yeah. I mean, people, you're showing an example of people that look pretty good on paper. The end, they're going to be under two thousand dollars worth of assets. They're going to be wiped out. Um, their next generation isn't going to have what they acquired, and I think it's because we don't pay in early enough. It's because pe folks haven't bought into long-term care insurance enough, right? To the extent that long-term care insurance could be paying for this, right? Although, and that's true. That's true. I mean, it would be it would be handy if there were a private pay option. Right, um, but those are expensive options, and and as a practical matter, on the ground right now, most people don't have them. So the question is, is Medicare, which is supposed to be covering a lot of this stuff, going to be covering it? And what is the mechanism through which they're going to be covering? It? I think. Do you know of any VNAs that have provided the service and then have not gotten reimbursed? Mm, no. Okay. No, I don't. Uh, but that would be an interesting survey <clears throat> to see what VNAs are kind of stepping up and doing this. Mm -hmm. So I've also talked about that with VNAs. So, so you know, do we want? Do you want to be the VNAs that tries to figure that out? Mm -hmm. Of course, from their perspective too, they're very nervous about this because if they pay, and then as you know, those, the, these folks all get paid. It's all prospective payment. So they they'll bill Medicare, will send them a check. At the end of their service, Medicare will send them another check, and then nine months, a year down the road based on random audits, right? Medicare may say, oh, we decided that those weren't really justified services, and therefore we're gonna reduce this month's check to you, because these folks live on the Medicare check, it's a huge check. We're gonna reduce this check to you by $50,000, $100,000, right? There was a, and they're all aware of the, of the, of the example, the VNA in uh, Martha's Vineyard, they do a lot of work in Martha's Vineyard, and that VNA went under last year, because that's what happened. There was a Medicare audit, Medicare said, you know, we're not paying you know, quarter, some large amount of money. Um, and so they went and solved it, right? There was nothing that they could do. I mean, you could appeal, but then during the appeal process, they, were going, they went under, right? So they're nervous that if it sparks an audit, right, that the audit, and by the way, if it sparks an audit, then the auditors come in from Medicare, and they're not just looking at, about at the general cases. They're looking at everything now. They're looking at the stark regulations. They're looking at everything. And so that's the, everybody's worst fear is that Medicare will show up, right, and do a kind of a general audit. So they just want to stay away from this. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, thanks for a nice presentation. It helped me. I'm, I've heard about this in, in the background. My question is actually much more specific. Much of what you laid out there, I would say, is applicable to Medicare Part A. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we do our, all our work as Medicare B, out, outpatient, and I do think, I've, I've heard that there are ramifications in terms of Part B as well. Yeah, as a matter of fact, all, all this, I, I focus this because um, this is the, these have been the two audiences I've been talking to, have primarily been the VNAs and the SNPs. But yes, Medicare Part B, the, the, the section of the big manual relating to Part B also got modified. Uh, and so Medicare Part B does apply, and that's one of the issues that has been raised as far as the nursing homes are concerned, is that if they do this, if, if, they, if you can develop a plan of, of, of specialized care under GEMO, it could last beyond 100 days, because they'll get paid the first 100 days under A, right? And then they'll get paid for all of the supplementary work that they do at the nursing home under B, right, at the, at the end of the 100 days. So at the end of the 100 days, in terms of the kind of underlying stuff the patient would switch to mass health, right? But the additional services, the skill services, could get paid through B. And I realize the issue with B is that there's a cap on, the, or annual cap on how much gets spent, but, but these people suggest that this would be a classic override, mm -hmm. where you could get an override based on the fact that you've got a plan that you're sewing under GEMO is needed in order to keep this person going. Because you're absolutely right. I, oh. I can't speak to the other disciplines, but occupational therapists ham it in to them. You have to show progress, have to show progress, have to show progress. And so as soon as a little hiccup, they discharge the patient. And yep. you're saying that's not necessarily so. Anymore. That is not so. That is not the, the and, I, and that goes back to 
what the original plan has to say. If the plan, and, and I think that in many ways, Jimmo, the, the focus of Jimmo is should be very much around the occupational therapists as opposed to the nurses, right? Um, because of, in the, because of the nature of the patients being dealt with. But you, you need to be designing plans that show the need for services in order to keep people the same way, or in order to reduce deterioration, reduce the rate of deter deterioration. Kind of constant relearning of skills, um, exercise, right? Exercise regimens that are going to keep deterioration from occurring in patients that otherwise aren't going to have those re exercise regimens, especially because they're uh, Alzheimer's folks and they're not in the later stages. They're just like not moving, right? So I think there's a, this package of services that. That, which are skill services, I think can be justified as skill services and should be being covered. Okay, they, no one's figured it out yet. Though. Anything else? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope this was yeah. useful. You know, I'm sorry for no answer. Thank you. And thank you very much for seeing everybody. Thank you for coming. Always over. a pleasure. <laughs>